Hello, family. And another day the Lord has made. Let us get prepared and learn from God's word and, and his truth uh, and grow together. I'm going to be honest. When God told me this message I'm about to do, I was just feeling like, why, why would you do such, why would you have me do such a message? I mean, it's, it's ways of worship, part seven, creation on display. But in my mind, it's like, that's an unimportant topic. Who, who, who's going to sit and learn about that? Why do we need to learn about that? What's the importance of it? And I started questioning. And then as I started working on that, uh, on this message, I realized how much, how much he even says that God created heaven and all in it and earth and all in it. And it says that multiple times. How many times that God is, his word breathes out his, his creation. And wanting us to understand it. And and we need to understand it. And as I started working on this message, it was like, wow, I overlooked that. We we want to decide what's important and what's not. And all of God's word, there's a reason for it. And it's really going to play out if you listen through the whole thing. Just like me dwelling and studying. I didn't get it right away, but later on it was like, oh... I get it. I understand. But, yeah, let's get into this. Father God, man, I don't understand your ways because your ways are higher. Let me lean into your truth. Let me lean into your spirit. Let me allow you to speak. Because I don't understand what's important and what's not important. What I need and what I don't need. You know that. I do not. And I just ask that you just renew my mind. Renew all of our minds. That we would be willing to listen and, and hear and learn. And that we would grow in such a way that we start to speak. And that we hunger and thirst. And, and, and desire more. And want to hear more. And fellowship more. Just ask that this, ask that this word would be worthy. That you would take over my lips and my tongue and anoint and, and and that I would speak nothing but your praise and your glory. And may this message be poured out. May people listen. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Alright, so, so, so what's the point of this word? You know, we have to start seeing God through all his creation. He reveals himself through his design. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. And this first is, is, is claiming that we we are without excuse not to know God. But our mind gets so used to the natural, gets so used to the normal, that that we miss his invisible. Yeah, we're not supposed to live by sight. We're not supposed to live by what we see. Yet we are to live by faith. We should see how God moves through everything that's around us. We should be able to look at the mountain and see how greater and bigger God is. And look at the mountain. And as, as Jesus does, he, he reflects it and says, If you have faith, the mustard seed, you can say to this mountain to move and it will move. So he uses this big unmovable object to say if our faith in him is so great you can move whatever mountain is in your life anything that just seems to to be to keep you blocked to keep you stuck 
If, 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 if you have so much faith, you can get through it. You can get over it. How about the stars? How about the darkness? Do we not understand that in the beginning, it says that God, it, it was complete darkness. And God put light into the darkness. And we can look at that and say, okay, so I'm stuck in darkness. They're stuck in darkness. If he put light in the atmosphere from the darkness, what, what can't, why can't he do that within our darkness surrounding us? He's done it. He can do it. How about all the fish? How about all the creatures? How about that, that he will have us painting like a deer upon the, um, upon the waters, just peaceful, just grazing or flowing like a stream? Or how about producing fruit? How, how about we, we look at the seasons? How about we look at, you know, fall? When, when something of us, attached to us, falls and or dies and falls off of us. And then we, we, we get to winter and, and the snow, white as snow, Christ's purity sinks into our bones, into our bodies and, and gives us moisture. And then we get into spring and, and, and get through the storms of life. And we start to produce fruit. We start to produce because because we have been made white as snow. And we have been enriched. And now we're in the presence and, and growing within the rain and, and, and the sun. The radiance of the sun. And now we're producing fruit and, and, and fine green. And then... We're in summer, and our beauty is radiant, like the sun. It's you can't look at it, and we can be radiant and reflect God and His glory. As long as we start with killing off that that what's not of us, letting the sun so letting the whitest snow got Christ's purity soak into us, allowing Him. To get us through, like that tree that 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 is firm, trusting in Christ, that can get through all the drought and all the storms and stand firm and produce much fruit, and then reflect in the glory, but also standing firm in the fire through all those hot days. See, and then we can look at the fish of the sea. And we can look how we all, God had to catch and clean up. He had to snag us and clean us up and then throw us and conform us. There's much we can learn from all that we see. And in Job 12, 7 through 10, it says, But now, ask the beasts, and let them teach you, and the birds of the heavens, and let them tell you, or speak to the earth, and let it teach you, and let the fish of the sea declare to you, who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this, and whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. So it is speaking that we can learn from all the beasts and the birds and and, and that, that God's hand is in everything. We we are his handiwork and, and he desires such harmony amongst all of his creation. And yet the fall of sin, the the, the one with the conscience man has fallen away from his structure from glorify him glorifying him 
and then we fall into this fear we fall into this now we have to look at the the nature as it as it's spoken in matthew six twenty five thirty four he he's speaking don't be anxious about your life so he's using nature to be like look how i care for the birds not a sparrow falls without me knowing uh, uh, i'm nurturing they get the 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 worm they know exactly where to go i give them that wisdom that guidance because they're staying in harmony with me look at the flowers in the field how they grow how they how they have such beauty and they don't worry about how to dress and and, and now he's using look at what i've created so you don't have to worry because I created you f more precious than than any other of this creation. I formed you with my own hand from the dust. And I will care for you much more than the sparrow. I will care for you much more than the flower. But you have to trust me that I will do so. For Matthew 6.30 says, If God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? See, all this, all this comparing to the mountains, this is all about faith. See, Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he prepared these things. If we are desiring to be in harmony with him, we can walk into what he's prepared for us. But there, unlike the rest of creation, we have our free will. He wants children. He wants a creation that desires him with the fullness of their heart. Not out of obligation, but because of love. And uh, so let's look at a uh, further. Let's talk more about Job. See, first in Job 38, it says, so... Let's look at a little bit about Job. So God, he's not explaining to Job when, when he's complaining and, and, and trying to put God on trial for everything he went through. He's not saying, well, I told Satan that you're my most faithful servant. And told him, have you seen him? Test him. But don't hurt him. See, he didn't say that. He could have just told Job, Hey, I thought your faith was in me was great, and that you would never announce me, and I put you to, to the test with Satan. And, and But that's not what he said. I told him not to hurt you. But that's not what he told Job. What he told Job is, he he looked at all of his creation. In, in chapter 38, he says, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched a line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no further. And here shall your proud ways be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days begun? And cause the dawn to know its place. See, this first chapter, God is showing all the dimensions, everything he controls. And, 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 and you see that structure. He's like, okay, how does the dawn come and the night comes? And everything is 
structured and orderly. See, if, if, if we also understand this more and, and look with our eyes instead of our, you know, a whole, look at a whole picture, we look so narrow. We, we look at just, just our own peripherals rather than bigger than that. See, how are all these things? How does the sea stay in this certain structure without overflowing over the land? How is it all divided? And, and, and all these things should see God. But for some reason we, we, we can't. We're closed to it. But he is telling Job, he, out of all everything he could tell Job, he can just say, I, I thought that you would just glorify me and I allowed Satan to do it. He didn't say any of that. Okay. What can you do? Do you know all these dimensions? Do you know how to hold these things in place? See, that's what he's saying in chapter 38. And then chapter 39, he's talking about the animals. He's talking about how we can learn from his creatures. Like, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the, of the does? Can you number the months that they fulfill? And do you know the time when they give birth? So he, he's again, and he's talking about all these animals, all of his creation. To, to show his, his all-knowing, his, his complete power. And then, in chapter 40, he talks about these great beasts. The Leviathan and the Behemoth. And he's like, and chapter 41 is like, these are the greatest. Nothing can destroy these things. Only I can destroy these creatures. So his whole illustration is like, you see all creation. You see all these creatures. You can't destroy them, but I can. So who are you to speak against me what I can or cannot do? And that's where he's coming at with Job. And through it, through nature, through understanding how God controls things, and understanding that we can't, that's when Job was like, I didn't, I didn't fully understand you. I didn't fully know, know you. See, that's where worship really comes, because if you can't understand how God is moving through every little thing. I mean, even allowing Job to suffer, you know, he went through, you know, the boils and, and the loss of family, his kids, and everything. And God was just like, look at all my control. I can, I, I'm in, I can restore all this. You just gotta understand who I am and how I work. And and we get and and that's where Job really learned was to understand how God holds all together uh, and that he could trust him and he doesn't have to worry. Um, and that's the same for us. So let's look at Psalm nineteen. Well, let's go ahead and Psalm 8, because I'm right there. It says, O Lord, O our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers... The moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of, of him? And the son of man that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. And crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the work of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. 
all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So David's like, how majestic. You said all these. Your glory. You, you strengthen the babies. You're the one who helps them grow. You're the one who knits them in the womb. See, if we understand that it is God, God's the one who's knitting them. I mean, we could start to see, even if it comes through a bad time, that it was a blessing to help overcome, to focus on something else rather than dwelling on that bad time. See, if, if, we, if we could see that he is holding everything together, we can have peace when we feel like there's nothing but chaos. And then, as we look at these, we, we ask ourselves, what is man that you are mindful of him? See, I, I, I'm worshiping God because I'm looking at everything he can do through creation. And then I'm wondering, like, why are you mindful of me? Who am I? See, seeing all that he can do humbles me. And it, and it should you, too. So, and that's the very thing he wants to do with us. If you, if we look at Matthew 8, and I wasn't aware of using this until this morning. I had everything ready and prepared, and then I was at work, and this came across to me, and it's like, oh, okay. Um, and this is what God desires. He, so this is the centurion. He says, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And then Jesus, when he heard this, he was marveled, and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. So, the centurion is understanding how God works. How he's working through all creation. And this is how he wants to work through us. Where we can hear him. We can hear his authority in our life. When he's saying. Okay. Go. To one person. Do things this way. Look. Think about Moses. Think about when one time he said. Speak. To, strike the rock. And he shook it. And water poured out. And then another time when he said. Speak to the rock. And he spoke, and, and, and he disobeyed. He's like, well, God did it one way. Uh, and that brought him into disobedience. But understanding that God doesn't want to just keep us in this pattern, but he wants us to learn to listen to him. When we go, we go. When we stay, we stay. When we do this, we do this. And he wants such relationship. That's what he's doing with all his creation. That's how he's moving through all of it. And that's what he wants to place us into as his children. So as all these stars and everything around us is glorifying him, so will we. But he wants to move in such a way where, where we are his servant. Because like he says, a man under authority with soldiers under me. What are we supposed to be? Soldiers for Christ, not getting entangled with the with the civilian life. So in that same way, he wants to have such a close relationship with us that he can tell us, all right, do it this way this time. All right, now do it this way. That's, that's what he's speaking. Look at the seasons again. All right, this time period, it's gonna you're gonna lose your leaves. Now this time period, 
it's going to snow. This time period, you're going to produce fruit. You're going to produce flowers. This time period, it's going to be hotter, have more drought. And every single bit uh, of rotation of seasons, he, he orders at these certain times, specific times. And then... As his time draws near to the end, it gets a little more, but you still see God is in control of that. Look at the same way with uh, Elijah when he was in the cave. He sent the storm. He sent the earthquake. He sent this tornado, but it says he wasn't in them, but he still brought him, brought them before Elijah. Also seeing Elijah speaking and praying for the rain to start and the rain to stop as God saw fit. So we must learn his control and his sovereignty over all of nature. And that is how we can be still and firm and, and not fear anything around us, anything that's going on. Because we know he is sovereign in control. And you learn all this by looking at what all he's doing around us. What he's doing out there. But there's some times when you got disease for him. Look, look, at, look at Moses. When God wanted to prove to Moses that, that his power would be with him. He had his arms go into his sleeve and come out. Leprosy came was on his hand and then he put it back on his arm and then he put it back and then it was gone showing God's control over disease and all these other things see we we have to be able to fully see his sovereignty see his purpose and all things the people of the old testament they understood when they were not acting right God sent something and when they humbled some themselves God stopped it and and that's just like that servant. It's go this way, go that way. Listen, that's the type of relationship. Not being stuck in man tradition, but relying on the Holy Spirit to grow, to do new. Let's look at a Psalm 19. Psalms 19, okay, why did I, okay, 1 through 6, all right, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork, day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge, there is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard, their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world in them he has set a tent for the sun which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them and there is nothing hidden from its heat So look, we can see such that 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 his heavens declare uh, everything declares the handiwork of God. The skies proclaim it. The the heavens declare his glory. Night to night reveals knowledge. Day to day pours out speech. It should speak of of God's control. How everything is ordered and structured. And how then you look at man. You look at man without God. Man who doesn't proclaim God. And we look lost and confused. No hope every single... When, when something comes our way, we're, we, we're lost. I mean, we, we, we get into a turmoil and we can forget to call upon God. We get so 
I'll just rely on man. I'm, I, I'll rely on what I'm used to. I'll I'll rely on the comfortable. But like the centurion, he wants us to learn to to, to hear him because he has a purpose for everything that we go through. Otherwise. It, the word wouldn't say that he bought us with a high price. He owns our body. And whether we live or we die, we belong to Christ. We live to honor him. We die to honor him. Every moment should be structured within him, just like everything else within the world. And that's what he's trying to do with this new heaven and new earth. He's going to have a creation that is not faulted by sin, but that moves Exactly how he desired it to move. Without rebellious children. Without self-centered children. Without people who want to rely on their mind. And, 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 and their knowledge of good and evil. Rather than God's. With their justice. Rather than God's justice. So, let's look at uh, I, Psalm 89. 5-11 Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones, and awesome above all, who are around him? O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty as you are? O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. So look at this now. You know... When when the apostle when Jesus was asleep in the boat and the apostles were afraid, when a storm came. See, God told him ahead, we're going. Jesus told him ahead, we're going to get to the other side. And then when the storm comes, they're afraid. They didn't have that faith, understanding that God has control over all these things. And at that moment, they wanted to wake him up. And then he instantly st stopped the storm. Just like Jonah. When Jonah was being rebellious against God and trying to run to Tarshish, he caused the storm. And God had the storm upon him. And then as soon as he threw him, the, the sailors threw him out into the sea, the storm stopped. You can see that God is using these things of nature to show his power and his wrath. And as we listen and do what he says, we can be still in the moment and, and no longer have to face it. Or we can glorify him through it. Or we can learn how to do better because of it. How to rely on him more because of it. Just like Paul in the province of Asia expecting to die, but they learned how to rely on God and not themselves. See, we as you learn to see him and be in awe of him through creation and seeing his handiwork, you learn to trust him. But if you are blind to see how he's moving out there, you will not be able to see how he will move within you. <sighs> to, to understand, see this Ethan, the Azurite, understood that he rules the raging sea. When its waves rise, you steal them. 
You stop them. You're in control of it. Um, okay, so now... Let's look at... Isaiah 40. 25. To whom, then... Will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatest of his might. And because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Wait, hold on. Isaiah 40, 25-28. Yeah. Um, have you not known, have you not heard... The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fail exhausted. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. So now God is comparing how if we trust in him and his strength. See, it says that those who take refuge in the Lord in Psalm 91 will not face these disease or famine. See, you're taking refuge as in no matter where I am, no matter what I face, as long as I know I'm in Him, and I'm not doing things by my own accord, I am safe. Um, and we fly through these, these things of life, like a majestic eagle in his, in his wings. Our strength is renewed, and we get through it. We do not grow weary. See, you look, you look at, your eyes look at up high, and you see all these things created. And you're like, who can compare? Who else can create all this? Who can do all this? See, I mean, here's one thing with evolution. Even with their mindset that, that it starts out with an animal, and then just becomes this, and this, and this, and that. That would even be magnificent. I mean, how can you just keep transforming into something else? But it's not. There's thousands of different fish, thousands of different birds, different animals, so many different types of creatures. All having their own name. And... Uh, that is in awe of God. Who who can do? Who can form such things? And you know, and and I say that again with with the whole evolution thing. Even it coming, uh, a, a monkey turned into human. That would be magnificent to see. How could that even happen? That's mysterious. But that's not how it works. But even if it does, only God could do that. You know? Um, and then you... Now let's look at uh, Psalm 148. Maybe. There we go. 
Okay, so Psalm 148, 3 through 5, it says, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, or 1 through 5, from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise him all his angels, praise him all his hosts, praise him sun and moon, praise him all you shining stars, praise him you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. Look, look, all these things, fire, hail, snow and mist, they are fulfilling God's word. God spoke them out, and it's showing how mightier God is if, if you see that he is the one in control. He's the sovereign one. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and all flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all saints, his saints. For the people of Israel who are near to him, praise the Lord. So that everything's praising him. God is trying is setting up a structure where all his creation is praising him together, that every knee is bowing and praising him. God Deserves all the honor and glory for all his creation. And whether you become his footstool. Or you become. His child. His bride. Either way. You will be a part. Of his creation. Moving. Flowing. As it says in Acts 17, Paul comes to Athens. <clears throat> and this is what, out of all things he could share about the God of heaven, this is what brought forth the awe of him. Um, okay. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. So you go around. Um... Okay, so Paul, verse 22, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this description, To the unknown God, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. See, understand this. As Paul is about to share this, we see... That you got the gods that we form into our image versus the God who created everything into his image and to his display. That that all creation glorifies him rather than we glorify what we our mind desires. The God who made the world and everything in it. Being Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by hand, man, nor is he served by human hands. See, there's I've heard many people saying, well, God's they treat God like he's stuck in within within the church, within that building. They, they, they see him in one place rather than everywhere within everything. Like, well, we see God. God is on Sundays. No, God is every day. And and we 
are supposed to praise and, and be in harmony with him every day, every moment, every second. All the other creation is glorifying him and honoring him. The stars are twinkling, praise Jesus. The sun is like, you see my, my fire, but God's fire is brighter. God is not living within temples made of man. He is everywhere. And the more you understand that he is everywhere and in everything, you're not going to do things in the sea, in, in the dark. You're not going to do things in the secret. You're, you're not going to just view something that you know is wrong. Because you yourself know. He sees me. I cannot hide from him. Where can I go that I can hide from him? Nowhere. If you look at all creation, he is everywhere. Where can I go? And run from my problems. Nowhere. Especially if your hand is against God. If you are in harmony with him. If you are letting the potter. Move you as the clay. And form you. No matter what comes your way. You will learn and grow from it. So here is Paul's proclamation. To Athens. Starting with recognizing creation and that he formed it and that God is the one who builds and, and, and does all these things. As though the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said. For we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring. We ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone. An image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance. God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. All right. So he is describing, he's saying, okay. Everything, though you feel like he is far from, he is moving through every single thing. The everything, life and breath and everything, he himself is in it. He allotted periods and boundaries of every dwelling place. That we should seek God and perhaps feel our way towards him. We have to not look at God as the imagination of man. Not look at God as, as our ideas of God and, and just grasp those. But see him in everything. See him that we breathe because he allowed us to breathe today. We're not destroyed because he yet desires us to perish see although we are told in first peter this for all flesh is like grass people are like grass grass 
in all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fails, falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. See, in him, if we perish, we still live. If we are in him. Otherwise, we are like the grass who's just mowed away. Who's just gone tomorrow. Who just, if you look at the period of, of flowers, they grow and they die. They grow and they die. Their beauty shown, and then they're gone. And we have a moment. We have the word of the Lord remains forever. That's what's lived for. That's what we need to cling to. That's what's going to make that moment of breath, that grass of time in our own life to be worthy, to have purpose. That we take every little moment that we have to live in what remains forever. For as we see the change in the end times, the birds falling, the earthquakes, and all this calamity befalling us it is not a time for us to get focused and predict in times that will come but it will rather be like the times of noah see you look at the times of noah there was not rain but noah was told that there would be a great flood to wipe out the wickedness of man so he prepared and built the boat. And it will be like the times of Noah. We will eat, drink, and be merry. And then it will come. God's wrath will come. And our time is not to fixate on that. But it's to fixate on this. But rather, we should be pushing ourselves to draw ourselves near and closer to God and to look to save and reach all that we can wanting none to perish as Noah is preparing the ark we are to prepare and feed the sheep to feed God's sheep see here is another connection we have that we can look at nature and God's creation. The sheep. God looked upon the people and they look lost like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep who don't know their way. Sheep who just follow the herds, but they don't know the proper herd, the proper farmer to follow. One that will guide them into trouble or one that will guide them into peace and, and, and comfort. One that we are to feed the sheep. We are to leave the 99 to go reach that sheep that's lost. Not fixating on when it's going to come, but preparing ourselves and preparing those because God's mission, He is patient. He's not slow because He wants none to perish, all to come to repentance. That is our mission. Not the focus on the time period, but look at what's coming and doing our job, being our soldiers to save the captives and rescue them from calamity. That's what we need to focus on. And how do we focus on that? By focusing on Christ, by resting in his presence, by learning and growing from him, by looking to his word, looking to those who desire his word, looking to those who will speak the truth, being in harmony with his creation, being aware of what's coming, and yet not focusing on that, but focusing on the one that keeps us from stumbling. So, 
Though, I thought this message was unimportant. Paul to Athens, he spoke of God's creation. God to Job, rather than clarifying what he talked about with Satan, he talked about his power over creation. We need to see and worship God through all that moves. And the more we do this, the more that we see his hand, the more that we see him, we will not be shaken. We will not be broken. We will not be afraid. We will not be stuck in shame and, and, and just in despair, wondering why we have things coming on us, wondering, but rather at all moments of trial, all moments of hardship, we are like that centurion waiting for orders from the officer. Why am I going through this? Okay, let me show you how I'm going to move through you at this moment. I will move through you just like I move through the seasons. I will move through you so that you will glorify me. But this only happens when you learn to trust in God and not your regular movement, not what everybody else does, not everybody else's desires. He wants to be your God. He wants you to know that he is in every moment. And that every moment has purpose. Just like the drought, just like the rain, just like the storms, to the tree, it all has reason. And yet it is still firm and not destroyed. And the only thing that destroys a, a tree often is by the hand of man. By the mind of man. Therefore, I say this in closing. Put on the mind of Christ. You have died to this life. Your life is hidden in Christ. And he wants you to trust in him that you will not die or perish unless he allows you to that through all that you go through you can glorify him because he's in control let us pray father god you are mighty holy you are the truth you are the life you are the way we just ask that we move through you and desire to move through you. That we see you in all that we go through. That we seek to learn from you rather than going to our typical responses that we are taught by those without God. Let us glorify you. Let us seek you. Let us know when we continuously Rely on other things other than you. Let this message be heard for what it is. Let nobody think it's unimportant. Let nobody think that anything in your new word is unimportant. But let us learn and grow. All scripture is breathed out by God for correction, reproof, and discipline. Work in us and let us have ears to hear. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, brothers and sisters, I love y'all. God bless y'all. Good night.